the rest of the people that will be kind of leading the session and then we'll figure from there uh, how to go forward because we do have a plan, but I wanna give everyone a few minutes since I know that was a little jarring. Uh, sometimes if you're not used to the Zoom breakouts, it gets a little confusing or a little uh, unsettling. So also apologies, I'm having a cough drop. No COVID, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Rachel Goldberg. I'm with the DC Atid chapter, but I'm originally from New York. So I try to claim both cities whenever I can, just because stubborn New Yorker. Uh, we are going to be joined today by Natan Sachs and Laura Blumfeld, who I will introduce with much more information in a few moments. And we also do have members of IPF Atid here, most notably, of course, Alex Letterman, who will be helping me with some of our more interactive portions. So before we get started, I just want to lay a couple of expectations, ground rules, things like that, so that we can have a really good conversation because I don't know about you, but I'm very excited about this topic. Uh, my background is actually more in politics, so I'm particularly into all of the policy wonk pieces and very excited to see what's going to happen with the Biden administration. So ground rules. We are going to try to make sure that we give everybody the opportunity to participate in this conversation. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Please be mindful that although I and the speakers may have our political biases, IPF is nonpartisan and we are going to try to keep our conversation as nonpartisan as we are able to do so. Uh, obviously the speakers have their own organizations that they represent as well as their personal views uh, that are separate from IPF. So we are going to keep that in mind when we direct certain things towards them and allow them to answer, but know that when we're asking questions, we're going to try to keep it a little bit more in the middle. Um, if you have anything that you wanna point out, you can send it to me directly or to Alex directly. If you have any technical issues, definitely let us know so we can get you set up. I'd also just, I know you were already putting it in the plenary chat, but if you don't mind just telling us you know, your name, where you're from, that would be great. Either put it in your name or put it in our chat. Other than that, I think we're good. If I missed anything, Alex, please interrupt me. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Haven't done the disclaimers in a little while. <laughs> so, uh, as I mentioned, my name is Rachel and I will be your moderator this evening. So I have a couple of questions to start off with and one for the end. And uh, in between that, I would love for all of you to ask the questions instead. I also just want to mention, uh, we have a couple of other members of IPF in here who helped us plan this, including Talia. Uh, and I believe Shelly is in here too. Uh, and if there's anybody else that I did not mention, I apologize and please just shout me out now. <laughs> so to start off, uh, our speakers today are going to be, as I mentioned, Natan Sox and Laura Blumfeld. And if I could find where you put, I put your bios, that would be great. <laughs> so, Sorry about that. My notes are not in order, which is really bad. Why can I not find your bios all of a sudden? I'm so sorry about that. Just skip it. It's the most boring part. Oh, I'm Rachel sure Lundfeld is extremely accomplished a journalist, and she's served both, in the State Department. Yes, uh, you are both incredibly accomplished, and that's why I wanted to mention them. But we will put your links in the chat, please. Uh, someone can find them. I'm so sorry. I don't know why my notes are doing this. I've had the worst tech weekend. It's carrying over apparently. So apologies to everybody. And if my computer shuts off in the middle, I am so sorry. And Alex will just take over. Anyway, let's get into it then. So to just kind of lay the field for anybody who has not been obsessively following these issues, because honestly, you have to be to know every little twist and turn that has happened. Uh, the highlights that you need to know Israel is unfortunately very likely about to go into its fourth round of elections in the last year and a half or so. So there is some political instability within Israel, Israeli politics at least. Uh, on the Palestinian side, just because that does come up a lot, I wanna just mention that there is also some internal uh, shifting happening right now because Saab Arakat, who was a party leader, recently passed away due to COVID. On the American side, we are of course going through our administration changeover. Vice President, uh, President elect Biden will be taking office in less than a month now, <laughs> so 30 days. And uh, he has designated Tony Blinken as his Secretary of State designate. Uh, Secretary designate Blinken is a, the grandchild of Holocaust survivors. He also worked in the State Department under President Obama. Also, just because I think it's kind of fun, if you haven't seen his video on refugees with Grover on Sesame Street, you should absolutely go watch it after this session. 
Thank you, Alex. Uh, so the full bios are in there. Um, the highlights that I want to mention, of course, are that Laura is an incredible journalist and expert on this and has a background in the State Department. So she understands the US policy perspective from a practical view, because she has actually done this and was part of the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. And Natan Sachs, of course, is the director of the Brookings Institution Center for Middle East Policy. I was worried I was going to mess up the title. That's why I was waiting for the bio. <laughs> So if anyone has questions on that, please let us know. But before we get into actual questions, we are going to start off with a survey of all of you. We'd like to know, given the lay of the land, given the fact that we have three kind of fluidly moving governments that are in play right now, and at the same time, we also have had the recent uh, Trump peace plan proposal, which doesn't really seem like it's going anywhere, to be honest, because the players have changed so much since then. And we've also had the normalizing of relationships between Israel, the UAE, Morocco, Bahrain, Sudan, all within, I think, the last year. Um, so we want to know, before we get started and start actually asking these questions, please take that poll and let us know what do you think should be the priority? We have the Biden administration coming in. We have Secretary Designate Blinken coming in. What do you, as somebody who has been following these issues or has an interest in these issues, think should be their primary focus? So take a moment to answer those. And then what I would like to do is before we actually look at your answers, we'd like to hear from Natan and Laura on what they think those priorities should be. Then we'll compare to what the audience said and go from there. There's specific questions we're supposed to answer. Yeah. Uh, so in the chat, there should be a poll. Okay. That Alex just posted. Okay. You're going to answer that. Then the speakers are going to get us started by answering that as well. Uh, because since we're the experts, we want to know what they actually think on this. And then we'll kind of look at what the audience said compared to what Laura and Natan had to say. And we can start the conversation from that point. Natan, Laura, do either of you want to start while people are filling in that poll? Sure, Laura, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Natan. It's good to see you. Um, and thank you for that wonderful introduction, Rachel. We, we could just guess our, guess our jobs after we speak. We can try to figure out what we've done. Um, obviously, neither one of us succeeded in making peace, so we've got some work ahead of us. Uh, and thank you all for joining us from around the country and I guess the world. For those of you who I, faces I can't see, I hope you're either on a treadmill or in a bubble bath um, because you need to sort of unwind when you're talking about Israel-US relations, at least in the past. Um, so the answer to the, my answer to the poll would be none of the above um, because if the question is what's the first priority First of all, is, can everyone hear me okay before I go blathering on? Okay, great. Um, uh, I, I think that, you know, for President-elect Biden, his message to the world is America is back. And what does that mean specifically? It means it's time for the U.S. to re-engage with our allies, which we haven't really done, to re-enter a lot of international treaties and agreements, which we've walked away from, and also to figure out how to assert our power in the world in non-military ways, whether that's through economics, the traditional diplomacy, public diplomacy. Um, but very, very specifically, the issues on his agenda, um, I would say are transnational threats. We've got the pandemic, climate change. Um, and then of course, I don't know, we've all been on road trips, I think this year. I picture myself on that two lane highway, uh, I-95 in South Carolina. And you see like in your rear window, there's like these two trucks coming down right on your right and that might be the pandemic and and climate change but the big thing behind you with the headlights going right into your rear view mirror that's china <laughs> okay so that's what's on his agenda how israel fits into this i think more important than any specific issue that's the conversation that he's going to be having with the world i think the most important priority for the biden administration is tone because we haven't really had the right tone in our conversation with Israel in the past two administrations. I'd say under Trump, it was you know, indulgent. And the, the president before that, it was just irritation. I, I served in the Obama administration. I can tell you that every day people were just irritated with Israel. And um, you might agree with me that, that there was a kind of sense of indulgence. 
So I think what um, we can work through any problems, the US and Israel, as long as we have the right conversation, it starts by listening though. And I don't think that we've done quite enough. When I say we, I, I, I mean, we, the government or, or we Americans, truly listening empathetically sort of with emotional intelligence. And that is the platform on which Biden was elected. It was empathy. I mean, he was talking about national empathy, about the pandemic and about economic hardship among Americans. But I'm optimistic um, that we can kind of tackle problems and there are challenges, there are policy differences, right? Israel and America are not on the same page when it comes to Iran, uh, the Iran deal, which is really, which is a policy priority for Biden. Um, if you, know, you open up any paper on any day, you'll see that he wants to re-enter that deal and the Israelis are like, oh, that's kind of you know, existential dread for us. Um, but if we get the right tone and we listen sort of empathically, I think that we can we can get off to a good start. Thanks. Um, thank you all very much for for joining. Um, and it's wonderful to be with Laura on us on the same panel, not for the first time, I think, but it's always a great privilege. Um, and I love coming to IPF and IPF at these events. Um, so I'll pick up exactly where Laura left off. I think, you know, if you try to think about the Obama administration's relationship with the Netanyahu government, uh, which shall we say was not wonderful, there were sort of two major issues on which there were big differences. And I think there were two modes of, of kind of why it went bad and why there was so much frustration that, uh, that Laura heard in, in the State Department and elsewhere. The two big issues, of course, were, were first Iran, the negotiations with Iran that led to the JPOA and then the JCPOA where the policy differences are, are deep and they are real and they are extremely high priority, certainly for the Israelis. Uh, the very old joke by now is that for Israel, it's priority one, two, three is Iran, Iran, and Iran. And from the Israeli perspective, I really think this is what will determine more than anything how they view the Biden administration. And it's determining already their honestly, fears of the Biden administration as a continuation of the Obama administration. The second, of course, is the Palestinian issue, and in particular, different visions of where um, Israeli-Palestinian relations might end up and what settlements, uh, what settlements do to that. Um, yeah, sorry, JCPOA is the Iran, the Iran nuclear deal, and JPOA was leading into it, the interim sort of thing. Um, the, and what settlements do, of course. So, uh, obviously a very different approach than Trump. Since then, things have gotten significantly worse in terms of the differences between the two governments because the Trump administration was very close, if not exactly where Israel is and in some instances to the right of Israel on both of these issues. So on the Iran nuclear deal, uh, Trump surprised many, including many in his administration and against the advice of some in his, in his administration withdrew from the JCPOA and then embarked on what was a maximum pressure, but really wasn't maximum pressure, and then actually became maximum pressure. No waivers for sanctions on the sale of energy and an attempt to basically squeeze Iran. And of course, when you, when you squeeze someone, uh, there's a huge cost, of course, in a very large population, but you usually squeeze towards something. You sort of have to have an aim because just pressuring doesn't do anything. The goal seemed to be for the, for the Trump administration uh, the points that uh, Secretary of State Pompeo put forward, which I'll summarize for you, is when Iran becomes a Zionist uh, state, then uh, we can move on from this. So it seemed like we had maximum pressure and didn't seem to, to go in a very, very clear direction. For the Israelis, though, this was exactly what they were hoping for. And it was an attempt to pressure Iran until it accepts terms that are much more favorable in Israel's view than the JCPOA. On the Palestinian issue, the Trump peace plan was, um, was published. Uh, it was, to my mind, a peace plan between Israel and America. It wasn't really so much about the Palestinians. They, of course, weren't really party to much of the negotiation. And a, re and a result is that, and Israel was very, very pleased with uh, the Kushner plan. So when Biden, the Biden administration comes in, it, it's starting from a low point in both directions. I think still the crucial, so where do both of these things stand? On the Palestinian front, honestly, there is very low chance of negotiating a final status agreement, extremely low. 
And I think those who remember the great efforts that Laura Blumenfeld and others put in, I don't think there's a huge appetite for another attempt anytime soon under the Biden administration. So what we're likely to see on the Palestinian side is an attempt to limit the damage and to focus on things that can be achieved much short of a great deal. Maybe on Gaza would be my recommendation. That's where there could be a priority for something that's much, much less than a peace deal, but could improve lives for everyone, especially the Gazans. And on the Iran deal, that's where there's a lot of motion. And here I agree with Laura that a lot can be done very differently. Uh, Israel is not going to agree with America on the Biden priorities, but if there is an agreement not to surprise each other, to seriously consult, to take seriously both sides' real concerns, the Israeli concerns about the JCPOA are not crazy, and the Israeli concerns, moreover, about simply returning to the JCPOA which I don't know if exactly that's what Biden wants to do, but that is what the Biden team is stating now. Those concerns are not crazy at all. I think they are valid concerns, actually. I think they're correct. Uh, so I think a lot could be done quite differently with a lot more listening and coordinating and accepting that at the end of the day, there will be real policy differences. Great. I'm going to now throw in the monkey wrench, though. Uh, we've now discussed the uh, Biden administration's priorities or what we think they should be. But before we look at what the audience thinks they should be, I'm going to ask you, how do you think Congress comes into play? Because that is yet another political body in flux. Uh, there's an election January 5th that will determine control of Congress or control of the Senate. So it can impact the decisions that are being made, but with the elected officials that we have in Congress and the actions that Congress has been taking lately, we've seen emerging uh, voices that are not necessarily in congruence with the Biden administration's plans. So how do you think that could potentially impact these relationships? Uh, well, in a word, if Biden is about empathy, Congress is about antipathy. <laughs> so I'm not as rosy on Congress. Um, when I was a national reporter at the Washington Post, I avoided it as a, as a beat. Um, and actually it was one of the reasons why I went out and wrote a book called Revenge because a friend of mine who was high up in the, actually in the Democratic majority at the time, they lost power. And he said to me, well, it's okay because you know when we're out of power, we can undermine everything the Republicans can do and that's satisfying for us. So unfortunately, um, the only sort of, sort of sliver of light of hope is leadership comes from the top. And if, you know, if there is this kind of bipartisan spirit, which Biden definitely brings um, to the White House and his experience in Congress also was, you know, as somebody who could work across the aisle, if there's some trickle down uh, empathy and cooperation. I also don't think that it's a bad thing if, you know, the Biden executive, you know, the State Department, the White House seems to be tilting a little bit to the left for some folks in Congress to call them out when it comes to the Middle East and, and the other way around too, if they're going too far to the right for the more progressive wing. Um, that, that actually works. And I saw that again in action when I was at the State Department, I finally developed some appreciation for Congress because when we would meet with various members. Um, and I could see actually how some of our more, um, I don't want to call it extreme, but some of our sort of more out there ideas were kind of reined in by Congress, you know, who's constantly thinking about their constituencies. So I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, as long as it's productive disagreement rather than just, you know, unproductive revenge. Yeah, so let me start in the, the same gloomy place. I, you know, uh, Washington, where, where I am at the moment, is very dysfunctional, and uh, Congress is um, maybe the epicenter of that. So, you know, we're not, I don't think we're looking at a very uh, successful uh, time forward. A lot will be determined by the special elections in Georgia, but not all of it. I mean, that even if both went to the Democrats, which I have no idea, but even if they both went to the Democrats, uh, it's not that, uh, you know, Biden can do whatever he wants. It still means that Joe Manchin and some other people are, are the veto players, and it'll, it'll still be very difficult to pass many things in, in the Senate. Still, there are important issues where Congress is very relevant, and I'll, I'll mention two or two and a half. One is uh, on the Palestinian issue. A lot of the measures that the Trump administration took to cut off all aid and eventually all ties, basically, official ties to the Palestinians, uh, included important elements of legislation. Uh, the Taylor Force Act, but other things that made it very difficult to provide aid even to the most benign you know, hospitals in East Jerusalem, 
uh, these, those were stopped. And even to provide aid for civil society in the West Bank became very hard for a period because of legislation, part of it just sloppy legislation, honestly, that even didn't actually mean to do that. Undoing some of this can be done by the, by the administration through executive order, but not all of it. And, and there Congress will have an important role and the House is not enough. You need, of course, the Senate to, to pass legislation. So that's one element, and, and it's going to be very important. And that's much, again, much short of any peace deal or anything like that, uh, which is not happening anytime soon, I'm afraid. But all, but even just to resume aid and to resume a relationship with the Palestinian Authority and the, and the PLO. The second issue is on Iran, and this relates to a broader sort of trend. I think the United States is entering a very difficult period, or already, sorry, already has entered a very difficult period in terms of its foreign policy. We used to say that foreign policy, um, the politics end at the water, water's end, meaning that you know, as soon as we leave the United States, or as soon as American leaders leave the United States, there's no Democrat, Republican, there's just Americans. Uh, that is not even remotely the case anymore. Uh, our, our foreign policy is extremely partisan, and it's not just about Israel. Uh, we saw the Secretary of State speaking at a party convention during these elections, something that has never been done, I think never been done in the past. He spoke from the embassy in Jerusalem, which to my mind was more about intra-Republican primaries in 2024 than even about the elections in 2020. Um, and, but more importantly than that, and I'm not trying to score points against this administration, the previous one. My point is that when the world looks at the United States these days, and it thinks about America signing a, a deal, for example, any signature has a four-year expiration date. And this is true about Trump, it's true about Biden, it's true about Obama. So the JCPOA, Iran signed it, and then it's annulled or the United States withdraws and effectively annuls it um, immediately uh, the next time there's a national election in the United States and vice versa. So Trump embarks on a maximum pressure campaign. Immediately there's a campaign, there's a national campaign in the United States, Biden wins, it's over. We're going back to the old, uh, old route. So what's gonna happen now is what I call the waiting for Nikki and Don's strategy by many parties, which is to say, if they're afraid of Biden, okay, Nikki Haley or Don Jr. might be president in four years. And if I prefer that side, then I'll just wait, I'll hunker down and wait. Uh, that's very unhealthy for the United States long-term as a foreign policy position. And that means that bipartisan support for foreign policy, which is very hard to do, is actually very important. Even if you're an ardent Democrat or an ardent Republican, and you want to withdraw from the JCPOA or jump back in, you have to think very carefully about how you craft a policy that might survive an election and, and also be seen abroad as a policy that will survive an election. So if you're Biden, you need, I don't know, Lindsey Graham on board. And if you're Nikki Haley in four years or whoever it is, you're going to need Chris Murphy or Chris Coons or someone on board. And um, that means that Congress becomes all the more important which is slightly depressing because where both Laura and I started is that Congress is all the more difficult. So Alex, interrupt me if we have the poll results, but I do want to follow up on Natan's last point after. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you want me to share the poll results now? I think everyone who has voted has, or everyone who is going to vote has voted. So uh, Rachel, if you want, I can take a second to share the poll results or you can follow up with Natan, it's up to you. You know, what, let's do the follow up and then we'll do the poll results before we open for more questions, unless Laura and Hatan have a different preference. Sounds good. Why don't you follow okay. up and then I'll share the poll results. So I'm curious, since Natan brought up just the idea of this expiration date on agreements from the US, and particularly since Laura has a background working on these kinds of agreements, and we now also have uh, particularly not only whatever the Biden administration chooses to do going forward but we do have the Abraham Accords, which were just brought about by the Trump administration. What do you see as the steps that can be taken to make sure that agreements can be understood to last past a political changeover within the US? I would just say from the, from let's say the Israeli side, since we're talking about Israel is don't get pulled into it. Don't get sucked into that game, which I think you know, we saw happened in a sort of dramatic extreme way with Netanyahu under the Obama administration. He just, he played into it and he played it up. Um, so I, I, I think again, if each American president kind of has an animating 
theme right to their presidency. You know, for Trump, it was about winning winners. For Obama, I feel like, and Israel fit nicely into that. Uh, Obama was very often about justice, and that was kind of sometimes problematic, especially when it came to Israel and the Palestinians. I, I do, can't tell you the one word description of Biden yet, but if I had to guess, it would be something about second chances. And so what if Netanyahu is going to be the prime minister, which again, as you said, we may be going into our fourth election in two years. Um, I would I would just caution him and say this is your second chance, you know, with a Democratic president and and don't play the partisan game. It will it, you, it's short term games and long term losing strategy. Yeah, I agree very much. And I think if we think about the nor normalization agreements, uh, they're actually very different from one another. Uh, they sort of have a wave and they feel like they're the same thing, but they're actually very different. So uh, the UAE is the in many ways the cornerstone is the first and, and in many ways the most important, well, I don't know if it's the most important, but it's the most notable of these. It's the full normalization and it's one where both parties genuinely want it, which is a big plus when two parties are, are having a relationship is that both, both parties are interested. Um, and so you see the, you know, now there are thousands actually of Israelis in Dubai and Abu Dhabi right now. Um, they were in Hanukkah and, and et cetera. And received very nicely so far at least. And, and this, there seems to be just a genuine interest by the UAE to have this. Now, of course, there was an American component to it, a very important one, which is the sale of F-35s, but also other things. Um, the Israelis are very supportive of it. I don't see that being reversed in any way. I don't see a Biden administration or most Democrats in Congress opposing that kind of deal. The same with Bahrain. I don't know what Bahrain really wants. It usually sneezes only when Riyadh approves, but assuming Bahrain, uh, you know, taking into account Saudi positions wants this, then again, there's no, I don't think there would be any problem. With Sudan and Morocco, it's more complicated. Sudan was really forced into this by the Trump administration. They desperately needed to be delisted as a terror, as a sponsor of terrorism, which they no longer are a sponsor of terrorism. Uh, they're going through a very difficult transition. And, um, and the Trump administration basically said, if you want to be delisted, you better have relations with Israel. So how much of that survives, I don't know. And how much would the Biden administration spend political capital now on a, a tertiary at best issue? Uh, when you, foreign policy is not even the top issue for Biden and Middle East is not top foreign policy issue. And Sudan-Israel relations is not remotely the top issue in the Middle East, maybe Iran is. So. I don't know how much Biden would work to to support that. And, you know, if I were a Biden aide, would I tell him this is what you should spend your capital on forcing Sudan to do something he doesn't want to do? Morocco is a very complicated one, too. Very different. Um, Morocco, the normalization is not remotely full normalization. This is a resumption of ties that existed in the past, including a liaison office, a sort of um, uh, Israeli affairs office in, in, in Morocco and Rabat. And, uh, and probably direct flights. It's very important, it's very considerable. Uh, there are many, many, of course, Israelis of Moroccan origin. Um, and so it's, it's very notable, but what Morocco got from the United States for this, from the Morocco perspective, is enormous. It's probably the number one foreign policy issue for Morocco, bar none, which was recognition of its sovereignty over Western Sahara. That's a huge issue for other parties as well, the Algerians who strongly oppose it. Uh, the Sahrawis, many Europeans and others who view it as a matter of international law. I don't know if Biden administration would walk it back. I imagine they would not, but it certainly complicates things quite a bit. Um, it may be a done deal. I don't imagine the Biden administration doing similar, very dramatic steps as to promote half deals. Uh, you would certainly see them support normalization, UAE, Israel, easy case. Morocco and definitely Sudan, I don't think that's going to be pursued. Um, but I'll just, I'll just make something clear. It's, if you don't, you know, if you accept that what Trump did is American, standing American foreign policy, even if you don't pursue it, continue to pursue it, that's not harming American, the, America's ability to operate in the future. The question is whether you negate, whether you say, yeah, the previous guy signed it, but that's the previous guy. That's a different story. Um, and, and there we should be careful, even with, with, when it's something we don't like. I'll, I'll share a secret with you. I'm not a fan of Trump. But even things that Trump did that I don't like, often, you know, sometimes you just have to negate them. I think we should jump back into the Paris Accords. 
but I will recognize that there is a price to all this back and forth. There is a price even to jumping back into Paris, which I 100% support. There is a price to that. And it's important that we think about this when, when we think about foreign policy. I, I think just to pick up on what Natan said, it's very likely that what we'll do is we won't you know, reverse or maybe even, these were deal sweeteners. You know, I called it lollipop diplomacy. You know, here you get Sahara and you get F-35s and, and here you get delisted. Um, there'll be no more lollipop diplomacy. Um, will they dilute some of those sweeteners? Possibly, but I doubt it. Again, I think there's just too much going on. I think what they're gonna do though is change the game, which uh, you know the Israelis won't like. And when I heard about Morocco, I said, oh, they finally got their land for peace deal, except it's different land um, and a different kind of peace, um, not, the, not the land that we've been negotiating about all this time. But I do think that what the Biden administration is gonna ask for is concession, or if they're the ones brokering the deals, they're gonna want concessions from the Israelis vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians in order to reach a broader peace. At which point the Israelis might just, you know, go on their road. They're having their own little regional festival right now, re reorganizing, um, especially if America is busy or I don't think it's going to try to pivot exactly. Um, you know, they, every time America announces a pivot, they get, you know, a, a knife in their back, ISIS, right? Last time we pivoted. Um, so, but I do think that, um, you know, Israel itself may just go out and, and see what other, you know, if there's some sub-Saharan African countries or Tunisia supposedly is primed Oman, um, because I don't think that they're gonna wanna concede anything now that they learned that they can get peace for free as they, they called it, or at least on their own terms. No, I mean, that's an excellent point. And I definitely want to pursue both of those lines a little bit more. But before we do, I want to just kind of have the audience weigh in a little. So Alex, do you have those poll results? Yep, I'm going to share my screen right now. So here are the results of the poll. Can you guys see it? Yes. So as you can see, so, yeah, go for it, Rachel. Go. No, please go. Looks like the JCPOA got the most support here for Biden's policy priority. Rachel, do you have any other comments about this? Anything stand out to you? I mean, what I'm really curious about is given the background of the conversation that we are currently having, do we see any of this changing? Because right now, I think by the fact that most of our audience is prioritizing JCPOA, or I guess that has the most votes of these options. It seems to be, and I'm curious if Natan and Laura agree, that maybe the audience is leaning more towards what Natan and Laura have been saying, where, where the priorities lie is really more in general diplomacy, general relationship building, because I'm reading JCPOA as being part of that. I also I'm do- I'm Yes, please what people mean by JCPOA, do you mean re-entering the deal as negotiated under Obama or renegotiating? Because, you know, the, the sort of mantra that I heard the whole time that I was in the administration was Secretary Kerry saying, you know, no deal is better than a bad deal. And then Trump came along and said, it's a bad deal, no deal. Um, so when you all picked JCPOA, do you mean let's get back in as written or do you mean let's renegotiate? We'd love for you to answer in the chat audience members who picked this or something else and you want to comment as to your reasoning, that would be really helpful. I, I always found it awkward that the US was negotiating this deal for the benefit of the Gulf and Israel, right, against their sort of arch enemy. And yet they were all saying, no, 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 please, <laughs> we don't like it. Um, so yeah, so I'm just curious to hear what folks were thinking when they picked that. I'll, um, I was just going to chat you a question more. I voted for the JCPOA because to me it was uh, the most immediate pressing issue that just felt like the most dangerous. But I was really curious about your answer, Laura, um, in terms of uh, changing the tone. Um, and I, I just want to know if you meant that in, in the sense of uh, domestically, like the divide that's happening between conservatives and liberals right now, or if you mean in terms of more of on the foreign uh, stage. But I thought it was a really curious answer. Here's what I mean. Um, Natan and I were recently in a conversation, I don't know if it's off the record, so I won't name the person. Natan, go ahead, you say it if, if I can, but with one of Israel's top leaders. And he said, look, we understand that America is going to get back into the deal with Iran and that it's important. You know, none of us want Iran to acquire nuclear weapons, 
but we just want them to hear us. Like we were cut out of the conversation. Again, I'm paraphrasing what this Israeli leader said. Um, and, it was and, on the record. Yeah. It was Yair Lapid. It's on the record. Okay, so Yair Lapid. And so I think what, when I say tone, I mean the power of I hear you. That's what I mean. I, I, I think that the Israelis, I remember hearing a conversation, Netanyahu was saying to, without again, giving away secrets or naming names, to a senior administration official at the time saying, you're putting us in an oven. Okay, that's how kind of uh, existentially neurotic, melodramatic, however you wanna put it, but that's how serious it is for the Israelis. So I think that when I say tone, I mean, they want to be heard. The other thing, um, which is so important when it comes to Israelis and another conversation I had with Amos Yadlin, I don't know if you know who he is, he's one of Israel's sort of preeminent generals, um, military experts. Um, he was the pilot who dropped the bomb in Osiric on the nuclear uh, plant in uh, Iraq. He dropped the first bomb. He was head of military intelligence um, when Israel took out the nuclear reactor, the preliminary nuclear reactor in Syria. If you remember that in 2007, and he was also, um, I think he was also head of military intelligence during the Stuxnet, right when there was that um, worm introduced into into Iran, which at least temporarily uh, debilitated the, re the reactors in Iran. So he's like a one-man counterproliferation uh, robot, although he's a. And he looked at me, and it was during the negotiations between Obama and Iran, trying to figure out how to go forward. And he was so troubled and concerned, and he's not you know, a hardline right winger. And he said, do you know what Israelis really want? He just looked exhausted, but he says, general, he said, all we really want from America is a hug, <laughs> okay? And so in one word, R, reassurance. I think that's what the Israeli, that's what I mean by tone. Like you can't underestimate, although all of you know, cause you're immersed in the politics of the region, how important reassurance for the Israelis and respect for the Palestinians. They each have their kind of, trauma. And if you ignore that, and if you just kind of go with the brain and not with the gut, you're going to miss out on everything. The la my last point is the good thing about Biden is he's not, yes, he's a smart, but he's really a gut guy. He leads with his gut and on instincts. And so that's why I think the tone will change because he's a, you know, he's kind of a Kishka commander rather than one of these Jimmy Carter or even Obama, who was brilliant in the intellect, but wasn't didn't quite connect emotionally with the Israelis. That's what I mean. It's just the priority. You can achieve so much more if you feel heard. And if I may just add, and there's a question now about about Bibi Netanyahu's uh, choice to to speak, you know, in Congress and to, to take it politically. Um, I thought it was a very bad move by Netanyahu, but I I'll just say, I heard again from a very senior Israeli who said, look. We thought the JCPOA was terrible. We could be right, we could be wrong, but that was our genuine uh, professional opinion. And this for us is an existential issue. Like, like Laura said, it, you know, they could be right, they could be wrong, they could be melodramatic. They absolutely think this is the melodrama and this is uh, uh, existential and they thought it was a terrible thing. So that person said, what do you expect Netanyahu to do? To try to play nice with the Democrats, play nice with Obama because of this and that? No, he's gonna fight with all he can. Now, I'm not justifying, I, you know, I, I still think it was a very bad move to speak in Congress that way, but the, it's, there is real value in not surprising, not just the Israelis, but also the Gulf uh, states regarding Iran. And there is moreover, not just in terms of reassurance and how they feel, but also in terms of substance, substance, they might have some real input that's worth taking into account. They, they spend all their time and all their intelligence efforts, which are considerable, on this. Could be wrong about a lot of it, and Biden, I'm sure, disagrees with Netanyahu, I have no doubt. The people who negotiated the JCPOA are gonna work for Biden, most of them. So I'm sure they disagree with the Israelis, great. But the Israelis have a lot uh, to say about this, and not just them. And it's partly because they also understand the issue very well, and they may have some very useful input. And it's partly because they're not going away, right? So we can be angry at Netanyahu, uh, and maybe it won't be Netanyahu very soon. Uh, uh, as of half an hour ago, it looks like Israel is definitely going to fourth elections, and that's the famous last words. But uh, but it looks like legally that's going to happen. Um, it may not be Netanyahu, but the difference is not big. Laura was quoting, you know, Yair Lapid uh, speaking at Brookings. He's head. He's leader of the opposition. He's different than Netanyahu, but he's also you know sounding similar and for political reasons. So. Um, 
My point is that the day after, if you ignore them, if you surprise them, if you hold secret negotiations in Oman and then they find out about it through intelligence rather than through a preliminary conversation with the Americans, then they will then try to cause trouble and they will then feel like they are left alone and therefore they have to protect their own interests. And it's not just the Israelis, it's also the Saudis and others. And you know, the US can disagree with them, that's fine. US disagrees with many countries, but it, they can cause a lot of trouble for the American interests. And it would be much better, I think, to, uh, to bring them on board early, even if it does make things harder in some ways. And let's say one more thing. Laura mentioned how, you know, Obama repeatedly said he will not take a bad deal. And he also said, and I'm pretty sure Biden said this as vice president, that all options are on the table. And this was an attempt to reassure the Israelis and the Saudis and everyone else that the US will not sell out for a deal just to get a deal. And it will, and if there is no deal, the Iranians need to know that they cannot pursue a bomb regardless because the US with all its power will prevent that. It's crucial that the US actually mean those things because, and it's not just that they mean that, that the Iranians believe it. Because if the Iranians don't, the deal will be much worse or the JCPOA way that we return to will be much worse. Um, America needs to negotiate this from a position of power, which it has, it is the superpower. Iran needs this deal much more than the United States. Perhaps we should return to it, okay? But if we do so, we need to do so uh, calmly and realizing who's in the position of power and realizing that regardless of what we think of the JSPOA, it included sunset clauses that will expire and five years have passed since we signed the JSPOA, soon six, and therefore, um, therefore we have to think about the day after, even if you're completely a JSPOA or you have to think about the day after and about what, what it includes. Uh, Rachel, is it possible to jump into the conversation? Um, we want to try to get a couple of other topics covered is the only thing, but if you have more to say on the JCPOA, please put it in the chat. And if we have time to loop back to it, we absolutely will. Uh, I wanted to just give Zach a chance to ask the question that he sent me in direct chat. Uh, if you want, Zach, you can unmute yourself. Otherwise I can read it after. Yeah, that's not a problem. Um, so I'm a GW grad student and I'm actually doing my capstone on the Abraham Accords. Um, so my question for both of you is when you're looking at a lot of the recent normalization agreements, um, are there certain components, whether it be security, foreign investment, bilateral trade, or specific sectors, such as healthcare, artificial intelligence, agriculture, technology, that are the most important for Israel going forward? And are there certain actions that the U.S. can take to facilitate these agreements to bad, have better relations? a good question. Um, it's a bit hard to answer because I think to a certain degree for Israel, the most important point is literally the signature. So what Israel's really after, you know, in all this thing is, is recognition as uh, almost juvenile as it sounds. Um, from an Israeli perspective, and I'll say I, I share this perspective, um, the very idea that we have to discuss, will countries normalize and recognize that Israel exists seven decades after its founding is kind of absurd. And the fact that, you know, they have to be bought off to say, no, Israel exists and Israelis could, um, you know, I'll, I'll share a secret with you. Turkey has full relations with Israel and relations are bad. And Erdogan is uh, maybe getting a little bit better now, but Erdogan is not a fan of Israel and he uses anti-Israel rhetoric all the time for political reasons. And yet somehow he manages to do it while having an Israeli embassy and direct flights to Turkey all the time. Um, and trade, by the way, has never even slowed down throughout all these crises um, because countries can have relations and disagreements. So all that to say from the Israeli perspective, a lot of this is simply about having relations. And, and in no small part, I think tourism, again, as funny as it sounds, tourism and the ability for the Israeli population to see these relations as normal. The direct flights, these are actually very important. Uh, they also, by the way, have business importance to them. Dubai is very well situated to connect Israel to Asia. And the Abraham Accords included uh, Saudi not only allowing Bahrain to sign, but also uh, allowing flights, uh, overflight passage to between Dubai and Israel. And uh, that's very meaningful. I mean, funny, but if you fl try from, fly from Tel Aviv to any place in Asia, including the vacation in Thailand, uh, this can shorten things dramatically. So um, 
so I think it's almost on the symbolic and tourism and sort of uh, that kind of side of things more than anything. Uh, there is, of course, also technology and military. And you know, if you look at hard numbers, let's be honest, we're talking about uh, arms sales and military cooperation. That's where the hard numbers are going to be. Uh, but I think it's actually more on the symbolic and, and sort of political tourism kind of side of things. Laura, did you want to add anything before we go to the next question? Um, you know, I could jump in and say that, uh, you know, I Israel has always joked, uh, I know one former Mossad chief said that Israel felt like it was the concubine of the Middle East, that it was all right, you know, the story, um, that it was constantly meeting with sheikhs in, in hotel rooms, but it could never be brought out into the public. So as Natan was saying, that kind of recognition, you know, now that look, a ring, a ring, you know, I think that that's very important for Israel. Um, but I also think that going forward, I do think that the economic ties, look, money, you know, common interests, especially economic, um, both Israel and the Gulf countries are very entrepreneurial. And I think at the end of the day, when you have shared interests, you're not going to blow it all up so quickly. So I think that that's, um, you know, it's great that there's this, uh, you know, emotional bond and, and recognition of each other. But I think that as long as they're doing business together, it's going to, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to. You know, it's going to stick. Three um, Israeli Arabs, and I do think that it can, by the way, have a positive impact on the Israeli Palestinian. We didn't really get into that too deeply, but I know that um, I just read in the, it was Mari maybe, three Israeli Arabs uh, put on white Galabias, white robes, and, tur and, 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 and Emiratis, and were hanging out. I don't remember if it was in Herzliya or somewhere. And all the Israelis came flocking around them, the Israeli Jews, because they thought that they were tourists. And we're suddenly open to them, and the Palestinians were like, "Look, see, we're we're all Arabs, and Arab is an Arab." Um, and for the first time, Bedouins are talking about joining the government. You know, Israeli Bedouins. So, uh, you know, it, it may take a time. It may take you know a generation even. But I just think the more you normalize, life becomes more normal for everyone. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little. I want to try to get in a few more questions. Jeremy, would you like to ask your question out loud? Sure. Thanks, everyone, and it's a pleasure to join everyone. Um, I have previously worked within the Democratic Party. Uh, I've worked in various parts of the pro-Israel political community. Um, President Biden is stewarding a major shift in the Democratic Party right now. We've seen new voices appear, whether it's Jamal Bowman in New York or Cori Bush in Missouri, um, who have radically different views from the traditional Democratic Party line. How willing do we think President Biden is going to be to even embrace kind of traditional pro-Israel positions within his administration? Um, the administration he's leading now is a very different political environment than it was four years ago. Um, and we're seeing shifts uh, away from democratic norms in Israel and in the United States. And I just wonder what kind of the values-based motivation is for him to even engage on this issue at all when we're dealing with such significant issues here. And when he clearly doesn't really have political allies who are in power in Israel. Um, so I think it's a great question and I don't think there's an easy answer. Uh, the short answer is that there is a major uh, challenge for Israel and the Democratic Party. Um, it's, it's, it's especially severe among the younger population. I probably don't need to tell anyone here. Um, and, uh, and it's very deep. And it relates to a few things. One, um, my colleague Shibli Tahami, who's uh, also at the University of Maryland, he's more there actually, um, has shown you know, consistently that younger Americans, and by the way, not only Democrats, but especially Democrats, view international relations more and more through a lens of civil rights and human rights and sort of questions of justice and less of matters of geopolitical power. Um, and in that regard, you know, Israel's the strong power, the Palestinians are the weak one. Uh, we no longer talk so much of the Arab-Israeli conflict. We talk about the Israeli-Palestinian one, in part because of the normalization now, but that was, that's been true for a long time. And moreover, you know, we mentioned already the speech in Congress. So you had Prime Minister Netanyahu do political battle with a president who, what everyone thinks of him, four Democrats was a very beloved president, Obama. Then they had the audacity to win that fight because Trump won and he withdrew from the JCPOA. Then they had the audacity to be best friends with someone who Democrats absolutely loathe in President Trump. 
Um, you know, Bibi's done among Democrats. I mean, there's there's no two ways about it. There's no way Democrats will listen to me. Yeah, well, he's an ally. That's uh, to my mind, he's done. It doesn't mean Israel's done, but it means I think among modal Democrats, uh, Netanyahu is, is part of the not with us camp, in part because foreign policy is such a domestic pol political issue these days, and people, of course, care tremendously about their own domestic politics. So if you're for Trump and against Obama, it's very hard to tell a Democrat, but he's an okay guy. Um, nonetheless, if you look at, you know, Biden and Harris both uh, were sort of a reprieve for Israel. Uh, Last minute, uh, the primary was won by someone who's very old school, kind of uh, APAC speech, uh, you know, I love Israel, all that. Uh, he mentions Golda Meir, you know, every Monday. And um, there's every time he speaks about Israel, sooner or later, you'll hear him say about his first visit to Israel when Golda Meir said, uh, we Israelis have a secret weapon, which is we have nowhere to go. Um, and so I do, you know, and the present matters a lot. Uh, it's true that there's a party and there's pressure, et cetera, but we've seen on many things that he, he, he's going to be the president and this matters a lot. It doesn't take away this generational issue, uh, but it does mean that with him and perhaps with Harris, which is very important in terms of the future, perhaps, um, there, there's quite a reprieve. I'll just add one more point, which is important. Um, if you look at opinion polls and you look at voters, the issue is very severe, as I said. Uh, nonetheless, you know, we often tend to judge where the mood is by what we all see on Twitter or social media uh, or among the most active people. And then out of nowhere, someone like Biden wins the primary. And then out of nowhere, the sort of, it turns out that most Democratic voters and Republican voters sometimes um, are sort of much more centrist and also less engaged in politics than we, we assume from looking at Twitter. And uh, and so what this means is that, you know, well, I'm going to give an example. 2018, okay, we have this, the blue wave, and we have this new class of lots of young Democrats coming in. If you look at that class, there's AOC there, and there is uh, the squad, etc. The vast majority of it are centrist Democrats, including on Israel issues. Elissa Slotkin, is much more representative of the class of 2018 than AOC is, much more. She gets a lot less press, but she is much more the modal Democrat who entered uh, and much more, of course, the modal American, obviously. So um, there's a real issue. There's a real uh, challenge for Israel, for sure. I think it's far from done in the Democratic Party, even if, as I said, I think Bibi is done. Okay, we're gonna try to squeeze uh, Addie's question in very quickly. Uh, and then I have one final wrap up. So we're gonna do both of those really short. Yeah, so just going back to the Iran deal and uh, Laura, what you have said about uh, Bibi's comment that you're putting us in the oven. Um, an Israeli who listens a lot to uh, what Israeli, the media portrays the discussions between Iran and, and America and Israel and how Bibi portrays it. Um, Few of these journalists or some, it's not in Israel among journalists. There's not a unanimous opinion that Iran is necessarily a consequential or existential issue for Israel, although that's how uh, Netanyahu uh, uh, talks about it when he talks to Israeli media. Um, it's really hard to know, you know, judging, you know, for myself, like, is it really existential? Is it really, uh, you know, uh, as something that obviously has to be re resolved, but is it really existential? So I think that's really my question is, what is your view? Is it really existential for Israel? Um, great, great question, great existential question. Um, look, it may not be that they're gonna about to drop a got bomb, God forbid, on, you know, on Tel Aviv. It might be the, you know, the smart bombs, the PGM, the pre precision guided missiles that they're developing um, in, in uh, Syria. So it's not only, you know, the nuclear issue, it's all the kind of mischief um, that, whether it's through Hezbollah, through proxies, you know, um, Iran is, is sort of has its fingers or tentacles, however you want to put it, in so many places in the Middle East, and it is affecting, I mean, I don't know, where do you live in Israel? Originally from Tel Aviv, right now I'm in New York. Um, oh, in Masters New York. Degree yeah. So yeah, I mean, as Jane Harmon said, I, it's a it's a Washington truism, but I like it. She said, you know, where you stand on an issue depends on where you sit. 
So if you're sitting in New York, you may not feel like it's an existential issue. But if you're if you're you know if you're back in Tel Aviv and there's an Iranian-backed missile that it used to be a dumb right a dumb rocket that would just land harmlessly somewhere in the Golan, uh, but now it could you know just go right through your window if they decided that's what they were going to do today. It feels like an existential issue, I imagine. But you know I'm I'm not Israeli. Maybe I should you know lob this one over to Natan, who is at least born in Israel. I, I, my understanding was that I, you know, Israelis are divided, of course, about everything, disputatious people. But when it comes to Iran and Jerusalem, that's the other, but we're not really getting into the peace puzzle too much tonight, which is a relief. But um, I, I, my understanding is when it comes to Jerusalem and Iran, it's like a whole other level of solidarity. Yeah, I think on the, you know, on the Iran issue, well, I'd say the, the spectrum of opinion in Israel on the Iran issue is much more narrow than, say, on the Palestinian issue. On the Palestinian issue, the right is obviously dominant, but uh, there is still something of a left, and there's certainly a center whose opinion on the Palestinian issue is fundamentally different. Fundamentally would prefer a world in which Israel does not control the Palestinians, who would want a two-state solution, even if the terms are not the same that Abbas would sign, um, who don't want more settlements. On Iran, the spectrum is very narrow. Uh, there, are, there are real differences on how to address it. So people like Yadlin, that, whom Laura mentioned earlier, or many others would say, we should be working as much as we can with the United States. We should not be antagonizing the American president, even if he does things we don't like. They are the superpower, we are not. Um, and we should, uh, and more importantly, and slightly in the past, but it's still very relevant, uh, we should be cautious about using military force against Iran, especially unilaterally, which was a major issue in sort of around 2010, 11, 12. Um, a major, major issue in the Israeli elite and a deep disagreement between Netanyahu and Ehud Barak on one side, Ehud Barak from the left, but on one side, and some of the generals in particular on another side. Um, there, there, there are big differences, but on whether Iran is pursuing a nuclear weapon, there's no real disagreement. On whether Iran supporting Hezbollah, et cetera, et cetera. Even Iran doesn't dispute that. Whether it would like to see Israel disappear, you just listen to the Iranians. So uh, there's not much difference there. On whether you should consider it an existential threat and whether you know the day Iran gets a bomb, pack your bags and, and move to New York. No, I think there, there are big differences. El Barak was, as I said, an uber hawk on using force against Iran, more hawkish than Netanyahu in many ways. Uh, also said uh, at the same time when he was secretary, when he was minister of defense, uh, that Netanyahu should not be saying the year is 1938 and this is an existential thing because if the year is 1938, then everyone needs to start fighting immediately, and uh, or they should pack their bags and move. And that's not the case. He, he was saying even if the terrible thing happened and Iran got a bomb somehow, Israel could still deter. Israel could still use its might. Israel is not loyal as they would say. Israel is not uh, devoid of capabilities. Um, uh, you know, he would not mention, but many claim that Israel has nuclear weapons and several different means of delivery. So, uh, so you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting in Washington, D.C. right now, and it's this is true about New York, too, but, you know, you visit sometimes the Pentagon, which is right, right, right nearby in Virginia. In the middle of the Pentagon, there's a, a, a courtyard, which is also a Pentagon, and sort of a crossroads in the middle, and in the middle is sort of an X. It's a five-way X, of course, in a Pentagon. That point is probably the most targeted point on earth, right? Because if you imagine how many nuclear weapons, uh, former Soviet, now Russian nuclear weapons are pinpointed at that point in the middle, it's very nearby here. So are we as under an existential threat in New York and DC? Of course, we are right now. There is Russian nuclear weapons aimed at us. Um, do we pack our bags and move? Apparently not, right? Uh, because the United States can retaliate because of other things, and maybe because we're stupid. Um, so God forbid Israel found itself in that situation with Iranian nukes. Uh, I really genuinely think that would be terrible. I do not think it would be time to pack your bags. And it's easy for me to say, because I already did. I really want to try to squeeze in if we can, although we really need to wrap up. Uh, if you have any just advice that you would give the Biden administration, but since we're wrapping up, make this your closing remarks too, if we can. Uh, try to keep them really short because we're kind of on borrowed time. I don't know when we're being kicked back to the main session, but wow. I definitely wanted to get that in. <laughs> also, gonna... just really quick, thank you all of you in case we get kicked at the end of your answers. Thank you. I'm gonna actually give you a cheat sheet since we gotta be quick. 
Um, three C's, okay? Clarity, context, commitment. So what do I mean by clarity? I mean, if you're the president, you have to state a foreign policy and you have to match your words with your deeds as the incoming Secretary of State, Tony Blinken said, superpowers don't bluff and you can't bluff because the only way that you're gonna have any kind of credibility is if you do what you say and say what you do. So um, that gives you leverage and that's where you get all your power out in the world. That, so that's number one, clarity. Context, as Natan and I talked about, um, and Natan mentioned, um, Obama said that his first two priorities was the Iran deal and Israeli-Palestinian peace. Well, no matter how good your policy proposals are, if you don't get the context right, what else is happening in the world? Those, it's like an email address, it's gonna bounce right back at you. And that's what happened, unfortunately, with Israeli-Palestinian peace because the context where we were saying to Israelis, take a chance, trust us, take a chance, about Israelis and Palestinians was completely undermined by the other conversation, the context of the conversation, which was, we're going to you know, negotiate this deal with Iran. And even though you say that you're less safe, you know, we think this is the right thing to do. So number two, context. Number three, commitment. Again, we saw United States presidencies fail and succeed based on their level of commitment. If you are not only committed, but passionately committed, to peace in the Middle East, don't announce a big proposal. And I think that Biden isn't going to announce you know, a big peace proposal because Middle Easterners, they snip out that ambivalence. I experienced that personally when I went out as a State Department um, official, I would speak to Israelis and Palestinians and they would say to me, you know, your president isn't really committed. So why should we take risks for peace? You can fake it till you make it with a lot of things in life, but not with Middle East peace. So clarity, context, commitment. Excuse me. Um, that was a hard act to follow. So I'm going to try with a, a, another tripartite thing quickly. Um, I think you want you want clarity. I agree completely. Clarity is the first point, and the strategic clarity. You want you want to know where you want to go, and you want to convey that very clearly to everyone because everyone needs to know what the superpower wants, so that they can start aligning according to what the superpower wants. Um, it's a lesson, and, and and I have to say it's something that. Uh, Obama was not always the best at, which is um, let everyone else worry about what the US uh, is after and, and they can try to placate us rather than the other way around. Um, the second is, you know, on operational terms, you wanna be pretty pragmatic, you wanna be flexible. So you have strategic clarity, but operational flexibility. Um, you wanna be able to, uh, to change course, you wanna change your mind, um, don't be too afraid to flip flop. Um, as long as the the goal is clear, you know. In Hebrew, you say uh, you you um, stick to the mission in light of the goal, right? So the goal is clear. That's where you're going. And then if the mission says, "Oh, suddenly I have to take a right because the the terrain says so," then I take a right. Or if I have to take a left, I'll take a left. The last point is on tactics, and there I think it would it would behoove Biden to surprise everyone a little bit. Um, I think there is a, an impetus now and also a domestic political incentive to be the anti-Trump, right? So, um, which is true, by the way, about Trump versus Obama and of course about Obama versus Bush. Bush was Iraq war and everything. So Obama came in the opposite. This big speech in Cairo and I am not Bush, trying to say that in 15 different ways, very eloquently, I am not Bush and America is not that. In comes Trump and in the least eloquent way possible says, I'm not Obama, whatever he signed is terrible. I didn't even read it, but I know it's terrible and I will negotiate something better. Uh, now Biden's a very different type, but the incentive to be the opposite is still there. And I think there is exactly zero need um, for Biden to prove that he is not Trump. He needs to do exactly nothing. Everybody and their sister know that he is not Trump. He is uh, in no way, he's just not similar to Trump in any way. And everyone has such clear expectations of what Obama will be because he was very recently vice president and an influential one for eight years that uh, there's a danger that he will walk straight into people's expectations and they will therefore uh, game him out if he surprises everyone. So everyone thinks he's gonna be now nice to Iran, tough on Israel, very tough on Saudi Arabia, um, all the sort of caricatures, honestly, of Obama, surprise everyone. You, you want to negotiate with Iran? Great. You want to do diplomacy with Iran? Okay. That's your strategic goal. Great. Start tough. 
start by surprising. Start by seeing what they can get after you, how, how they can chase you a little bit. Uh, Saudi Arabia, everyone thinks you're going to be tough. Okay, you want to be tough with Saudi Arabia? There's a good reason to be tough with Saudi Arabia. Fine. But tell the world and the Saudis in particular, convey to them that there's room to talk. That if they don't want me to be tough, okay, what, what do you got to offer? Um, so I would say that, you know, strategic clarity, very important, operational flexibility, but the tactical surprise is really very important as well. And I'll be perfectly honest, I'm not very optimistic that that's where it's shaping up to be. Thank you both. And since they're letting us go, um, if there was something else that you cut back on, I will let you squeeze it in now. I wanted to make sure that we at least give you a chance to answer that. But if you have any other just closing remarks you wanna bring up, anything you want us to take away tonight, please feel free to share them now. And that goes for the speakers first, but then the rest of the session, if any of you have a burning point that you just wanted to make sure we got to, now's your chance. And if not, that's fine. Uh, we have, as Alex put in the chat, we have our Tuesday briefing tomorrow that we encourage you to join if you're not already regularly attending. And we hope that you continue to come to our events. We are going to have more like this as well as a couple of other varieties. Uh, the Tuesday briefings are a little more of a lecture hall session. We also have a lot of uh, ATEED events throughout the year that are this, but sometimes on a smaller scale. Sometimes we do a couple of other things with breakout rooms. So honestly, if you enjoyed this, please feel free to just uh, jump in and join our other events. And I'm going to hand the mic over to Alex for other announcements. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel. Um, my name is Alex, and I'm the IPF ATEED National Organizing Fellow. Um, and I highly encourage you to remain engaged and connected with our young professionals work. Being involved with IPF ATEED can take many forms and our staff and volunteer leadership teams have worked very hard to develop opportunities for a range of interest levels and time commitments. You can be involved locally with program planning and networking if you happen to live in one of our chapter cities. You can stay informed and participate in our online conversations, especially in our open Facebook group. And uh, you can even apply for leadership training opportunities as they arise throughout the, the calendar year. Attend Israel Policy Forum's weekly virtual briefings on Tuesday. I sent a link in the chat for our upcoming briefing tomorrow and much more. Uh, through surveys and focus groups in 2020, we've also continued to listen to the needs and wants of our growing IPF ATEED community, which is, well, uh, which is now well beyond a few American cities and is a truly international network of change makers. Some cool announcements to expect from us in 2021 include uh, enhanced partnerships with Israeli organizations, since we know our conversation is only enriched when we speak with voices in the region, new peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunities for, for you all with fellow emerging leaders, since we recognize the heightened need to connect with each other during these isolating times, and more training opportunities for IPF ATEED members to sharpen their leadership skills and much more. Uh, that's all I have prepared, so we'll, cir we'll circulate many of these updates in the coming days and weeks from the Israel Policy Forum community and all of us here at IPF ATEED. Uh, happy New Year, and thank you so much to Natan and Laura and Rachel. Thank you all.